Welcome to the Voice of Creativity podcast. It's Brennan. Today, we hear from Winston Damarillo, and we learn about global innovation. There might not be anyone better to hear from. If you guys really appreciate meeting global innovators like this, please consider giving us a like or subscribe. Without further ado, here's Winston. Winston, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Brendan, thank you for having me. So this is exciting. Um, before diving into the details and some of the cool stories that you undoubtedly have, um, I just want to give a quick summary of some achievements that I discovered when looking into your background. And then we can dive into any one of those or other things. So it seems like, if I've done my research right, that you're a repeat entrepreneur with several successful exits. You've been an innovator, an investor, VC, an author a couple times now. Uh, maybe I'd call it like a tech enabler and like, or like a thought leader. Um, and of course, like CEO and things. Is is are all those right? Am I am I on the right track so far? Yes, yes, absolutely. At one point in time, and I couldn't make up my mind whether I'm a VC or an entrepreneur. So uh, I, I've actually decided to do both at the same time. <laughs> it, that's awesome, and you do you still do both? Is that yeah? I, I do both. I do both. I still do both. That's I mean, I enjoy awesome. doing both as well. You know, I, I started uh, you know my early career as. A, Actually, underpinning all of that, I'm a geek, right? I, I like to write code still. I still look at architecture. I still talk to my UX team, and I still really pay attention to the products we're building. Uh, but, you know, as a job function, I, I, I make investments. So I'm a venture capitalist, and then I run the company. That's uh, So I'm an entrepreneur. But, you know, it's always been, uh, you know, in those three kind of kind of uh, pillars of, of being a geek and, and loves and a deal addicts. So I like making investments and <laughs> looking in term sheets and, and also like building companies and leading people. That's awesome. I love that. The uh, Renaissance man approach. I love it. So before we dive into some of the historical stuff of which there's a lot to talk about, I'd love to just give the audience just kind of a context. Where are you based and what are you working on now? Yeah, so I'm currently in Los Angeles. Uh, I've been out in Southeast Asia and the Middle East for the last six or seven years prior to the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic got me back to the U.S. and I, I started uh you know, realizing that this is where I really wanted to be. Um, I, I live in Manhattan Beach. Uh, I bu nice. built my startups around Los Angeles. And actually, uh, coming back in June last year, I, I was just walking through Rosecrans, which is a street here in, in Manhattan Beach, and kind of, you know, reminisced and looked at all the, the buildings where I built my startups, you know, since... Uh, since 1998, uh, and and uh, decided that this is going to be my home. So you know, we built a venture studio called Talino Talino Labs. It's based here in Manhattan Beach, and uh, it's a global venture studio. So we get to work with people all over the world uh, in the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in Bahrain, uh, and in Singapore as well. Uh, but you know, I I'm just amazed by you know the continuous ecosystem of success for innovation here in the United States and you know I can honestly say it's still the best in the world. Well yeah, you're the expert. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm told that a lot, but I I've only, you know, traveled for business meetings. I've never really lived and tried to start stuff elsewhere. You, you so wouldn't cool. know until you actually experience it, right? So when I was here, I thought, wow, it's got to be easier to build companies in Singapore, right? It's easier to hire people in Singapore. It's easier to get talent in the Philippines. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and while some of that's true and some of the market there is, is a uh, green field, so it's easy to, to play in, but nothing beats America, man. I think, I think the, the, the ecosystem of support, you know, just, you know, I, I got to know you a few months ago and here we are helping each other out already. Right. And that's kind of just natural here and it's easy. Right. And it's, it's, it, it's part of our DNA as entrepreneurs. And, and this is why probably this is the best place in the world to really make differences, uh, so we're we're happy to be back. I'm happy to be back. I've I've since started moving all my startups. I have five uh, from Southeast Asia uh, into uh, a U.S. Uh, headquartered, you know, um, parent company in Talino Venture Labs, and you know, exploring not just the opportunities and the innovation, but all, you know, even even, even um, funding platforms like crowdfunding. Uh, so I'm, I'm having a great time uh, reevaluating again, and you know, it's sort of like. A great evolution from where I was started, you know, working classically at Intel Corporation, doing the old school venture capital and, and up to today. But, you know, it's it's amazing. I wish this pandemic uh, would be over soon and really, you know, jumpstart and kick ass everything else. But, but you know, I, I think it's 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 a fantastic time to be back in the U.S. and, and we're rebuilding again. 
That's awesome. Well, welcome back. I mean, yeah. I'm on the wrong coast, so <laughs> we're still quite far away, but <laughs> welcome back. That's awesome. Um, so for the audience who might not be familiar with what Avenger Studio is, can you explain that concept so we can understand Tolino Labs a little bit more? Yeah, so Avenger Studio, um, uh, which Lino Labs is part of it. I mean, it, it evolved over time. Um, when I was still at Intel Corporation, we, we followed, and I was a great admirer of Idea Lab. I was started here in Pasadena, Bill Gross. Uh, and his concept was that, you know, if you can create the infrastructure for success, meaning the creation of, of the, the factory per se, uh, that you can attract more market innovators and put them all in one place, right? And that was really the model of Idea Idea Lab and, and get people to just get on to innovating the uh, market innovation. Um, and he started all of that. I think he produced, you know, the most amounts of IPO in one shop. Uh, and it started to blend, you know, leveraging entrepreneurial expertise and capital. And so a venture studio today as defined is, is a, um, an op- a business operation. Uh, that has the capability to initiate startups and initiating startups uh, can be triggered by an IP you might already have in-house combined with capital that you're willing to provide um, innovators and attracting founders uh, into your venture studio. And and it's really, to me, a, a three-way partnership between us, the studio, a founder, innovator, and a, um, a capital source. Then uh, we've operated in that way. Now, we're seeing two evolutions to it, right? There are there are now corporate-driven venture studio projects. Uh, we've done a few of that. Uh, for instance, we we did a partnership with the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Bahrain to put together a digital bank for the Middle East. Uh, and then the other flavor is really the classic one we like to do, right? Like I have an idea, you know. Uh, for instance, we built, you know, what if we build a global migrant neo bank? Uh, and and we initiate that idea within the studio. We tell your you tell your friends about it. You attract founders and co-founders with you, and then uh, and then you fund that yourself, and then you grow it out. So I think I think it's the the model's evolving a little bit. Uh, there seems to be kind of a baseline of you tend to start with two hundred thousand dollars as a seed. So it's a bit more than what the typical accelerator incubator will provide. Um, it's a bit more deliberate uh, in that you're targeting a specific segment. And in our flavor of venture studio, we focus on on fintech. And even in particular, inclusive fintech. So uh, that was the other ingredient that I think is really important for venture studios. You have focus. Uh, that way, you can accumulate the expertise. Then you can consolidate the IP, and and you can be about. You know, you can offer the the efficiency model that we promise our entrepreneurs, so they have a lot less dilution. You know, towards the end of the life cycle of their startups. Yeah, and I, that that was going to be my next question. So perfect segue. So Talino has a focus that focuses on fintech specifically inclusive fintech, which which let me take a stab. You know, I've seen the companies you've been working on, so I'll take a stab at it, but then you can correct me and or put it better. So it seems like the focus of Talino is is financial technology companies that uh, reach out to the unbanked or the people who are underserved communities throughout the world, not just the US, of course. Um, of various types. And it seems like you guys are not limiting yourselves to just cryptocurrency or just something else. You kind of seem to be playing in microfinance and uh, insurance and all these types of things that might not be as developers easily accessible by everyone. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and great research, by the way. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think fintech has changed the world, right? A, a significant uh change in how we manage our finance in the, our way of life with money has changed, has evolved already quite a bit. And the fintech companies have done a good job, like Chime, uh, in, in, in making that disrupt the banks. Uh, however, in our opinion, uh, that's only been addressing so far cost and convenience. It's cheaper to go banking now and it's more convenient uh, because you can do this on your phone and in a convenient debit right. card. Mobile. What we see as the really big potential of fintech is to enable people that are not included in, in the banking sector today, right? This is the street vendors. And amazingly, that still exists here in the United States. Uh, it's the people that are gig economy players, right? That They tend to not have insurance and they tend to be wary about bank accounts and the, the banks tend to not lend them money or give them credit cards. Um, it's the small business that, you know, I, I just spent a lot of time in, 
in Los Angeles, and there's a lot of people that were actually excluded from the PPP, the, the Payment Protection, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, and they're the ones that would have needed it the most. And that's Probably simply because that. they weren't ready to be, they're not banked, right? They don't have credit scores and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So we feel that that's a market that nobody's really attacking just yet. Uh, we feel that that's market that's not addressed quite a bit because it's a hard market to be in, right? It's it's difficult because you're dealing with low dollar value loans, you know, you're dealing with day to day insurance, and we thought that dealing and tackling that problem as important as it is requires like a community effort. <laughs> and for me, one startup at a time uh, would have a hard time addressing it. So we thought, okay, well, student a venture studio model. Let's attract partners, right? JV partners, whether they're enterprise corporate builds or individuals that have great market idea that we will augment with pre-built technology and pre-built access to regulators. And that's the other thing that Talino now has, right? We've been working very closely with the BSA here in the United States. Uh, we have been selected to work with the F FDIC uh, to tackle the unbanked and underbanked. That's one of the news I was going to share with you as well. Um, so, so... As an entrepreneur and I have a market innovation idea, I can go to the studio and I've got all this technology. I've got a pre-built ecosystem. Uh, because of what we do, we've naturally attracted the work with the USAID, UNICEF, the Asian Development Bank, right, to be around us so that, uh, you know, the, the venture studio model can really deliver what it can for financial services, which turns out to be eerily um, consistent and reminds me of my early entrepreneurial ventures, which is open source, right? I've been building a lot of companies in open source in the past, and it feels the same, right? We were challenging the big Goliath software vendors with free software, and we started with a community to do that. And the only way to, to deal and address and compare, compete with IBM and Microsoft was like have an army of developers around the world doing partially pre, fee, uh, free work and doing you know partially you know, business uh, on top of that. So, so I mean, I've always, I guess, been in that mindset uh, that we built solutions uh, with the community. Um, what's, what's fascinating for me as I get a little bit more older here is that, you know, in the earlier iterations of my startup were, were geek-led, right? We were, we were fascinated by what Java can do and what all these technologies can do. Uh, nowadays, we're fascinated by, you know, how many people we've served, how many people we've helped. And, you know, in the last three years, the products that we built within the Talino studio uh, actually have touched 10 million people. And then it's 10 million underserved, underbanked people. And so you wake up in the morning, is you know, your life's a bit more meaningful than, than the day before. So it's, it's exciting. Uh, I, get to, I get to drag my geeks a little harder and they don't complain. Um, and, 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 you know, and I get to explain now to my, to my, my cousins and my uncle what, what I do. And it's not, you know, what's Java kind of question. Um, uh, so it's, <laughs> yeah, more it, more, it's more than that. So I, I guess all of that, right, coupled with what we're doing in crowdfunding, where we invite people to co-invest with us uh, and join in this effort and make them all impact investors. Uh, you know, it's just, it's highly, you know, energizing, I guess. And that's really, really exciting for, for us. And again, I, I always... Go back and credit, you know, the ecosystem in the United States. Like, like I said, I've been in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, and uh, you know, coming back here uh, give, gives me feel like I'm, I'm 10x more capable uh, back home. That's cool. If if the U.S. still feels like a force multiplier for innovators, that is great to hear because you know sometimes with the news and you know, the arguments and the politics and stuff, you kind of wonder if we've lost sight of that. So if that still feels true, even a little bit, that's good. That's uh, heartwarming <laughs> to hear. It's felt <laughs> more true in the last year or so. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot to complain about, but man, we've done vaccine really well. Um, you know, the amount of effort I see directly in how the government wants to help, you know, small business rebuild, you know, the, the amount of work that, the, the OCC, the Office of, of Controller Currency, the FDIC, the Small Business Administration, you can kind of feel it. The government of the United States cares for a small business and they, they, are, they really want to make it work. And they're signing up entrepreneurs like us uh, to be a part of this challenge. So, uh, you know, uh, that's unique. <laughs> and that's something to be proud about as Americans. And, you know, like I said, having, having traveled all over the place, I mean, nobody does this better than, than us. So it's, it's fun. Awesome. Well, you touched on two things that I want to cover before we move on. I want to make sure we dive into it a little bit deeper. So you said there's some news that you were selected by the FDIC 
to help with unbanked? What is what exactly are you helping with? I mean, is it is it bringing the unbanked to banks or or identifying them or what is well, educating the, them? What's the the, the project's called um, uh, Sprint Tech uh, by the FDIC, and the mission is to address the twenty one percent of Americans that need, lacks proper banking access, and it's on two vectors. Uh, they wanted to help individuals that don't have access to credit, or credit invisible, and small businesses uh, that wanted to uh, access capital. And, and the life cycle by which the FDIC wants us to think about is how do you onboard them, right? If, if, if the pathway to increasing the level of, of bank inclusion in the country is digital, like how do we get them more comfortable using biometrics or phones? How do we get them more, more on board to that, uh, number one? Combine that with kind of the philosophy on how to be financially responsible. How do you, you know, how do you understand credit scores? How do you like make sure you pay your loans and, and all of that? Um, and then how do you innovate the process of reducing interest rates? That's a really big problem for, for micro and small businesses, right? And that's natural because most banks understand I'm going to lend you money and each time I lend you money, it's going to have cost. And I will make up that cost by the interest rates I charge you. But, you know, but when you're lending small dollar amounts, that cost, that fixed cost by proportion is really high. And the way for banks to make that back up is by very high interest rates. Right. And so the way the banks loan money has to change. Right. And that's the other thing that, that requires a lot of innovation. So with Talino, we actually borrowed an idea from uh, from Bangladesh, uh, from the Grameen Bank and uh, the idea of lending circles, you know, the, the concept that. You know, if you have five people apply, apply for a loan at the same time, they're likely going to finish it. <laughs> if five people borrow at the same time and guarantee each other's loans, they're likely to have high repayment rates. <laughs> and if you have five people huh. uh, get the experience of how it is to get um, a loan, pay the loan, and establish your own credit, then you build uh, a continuous, sustainable pipeline of bank individual. And this is all manual in Bangladesh. And what we're doing now is digitizing that. And then teaming that wow. with deep tech, right? So a very old, very hands-on, very, very regular process. We're now connecting to AI. We're doing biometric, right? To identify who they are. We're doing social media and social networks so that they can coordinate themselves as they apply the loan together. We're using, you know, so kind of taking up like an old mindset and then bringing it up to the United States and then uh, innovating again in this ecosystem that we have uh, and then working with the regulators. So. Uh, it's it's kind of fun actually. It's uh, it kind of makes makes what we do exciting. So do yeah, I uh, totally buy that. What do we know? What the mechanism is? Why people are more likely to pay back the loans? Is it some sort of social mechanism like shaming? We're or something social like that? people, right? If you're you know how applying for a loan, it's scary, right? I, I remember that, right? And if but there's five of you doing it, it's a little bit easier, right? And okay, and if I somebody totally tells that. you that I'm gonna give you a loan where you can't get it and it's going to be of a low interest where everybody else is really high, but you do a little bit more work, meaning you guarantee each other's and you watch each other's back, then there's likelihood for me to take it. The alternative is nothing, right? Or the alternative is very, very, very high cost. And so you start training people to like be responsible together. And again, because we're, you know, human beings are inherently social, what that delivers is a high repayment rate, right? You're unlikely to default when you're a part of five because, um, you know, you feel bad, you know, if you let the group down, right? I mean, it, it still happens. People run out of money, but, but the intention kind of goes away, right? And inadvertently and on that process, you basically create good borrowers. I mean, you get them into the formal banking se sector and then it becomes feeder for SME loans from SBA and all that kind of stuff. But I think that on ramp That's part, awesome. Yeah, so it's... It's, it's one of the things I've learned uh, when I was traveling in Southeast Asia. We built this in the Philippines. We built it in Singapore. Uh, we've, we've adapted this for, for the Middle East. Uh, and like I said, I was pleasantly surprised that we can still bring that same impact here in the United States. And there's still people here that are unbanked. Um, but, you know, just, just the force multiplier of the regulators working with you as opposed to, you know, putting barriers in front of you is, is, is really great. Um, so... Um, those are the kinds of work we're doing at, at, at Talino Labs. Um, we have worked with UNICEF to, for instance, create a digitized insurance product 
uh, for children so that their education has continuity in case something happens to their parents, right? And and we want to make that super accessible. And working with, uh, so UNICEF has really pushed that hard. ING has supported us in that process. Again, it's a huge market that's underserved, uh, but it needs a catalyst. Uh, and the technology that we have coupled with the intent of UNICEF uh, in what they want to do for children and, and for, for global good uh, and ING supporting it kind of sparks that up. So it's, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's good to have that initial lift, right? Um, because, you know, once we get the takeoff momentum, it's a little bit easier. But when you're working with inclusion and when you're working with impact investment, that what you, that's what you get. A lot of people want to help you on, on, on the beginning. So we did organize Telino Ventures as a public benefit corporation. Uh, oh, nice. We ingrained in our charter that apart from making money, we want to deliver public good, and we want to measure that and report on it. Uh, so, you know, it also helps me, like, you know, codify the culture and get, get a lot of people kind of, you know, swimming in one direction. And, you know, we know what we're working towards right now, if it makes sense. Yeah, you're, you're, you're benefiting from the fact that everyone wants, not everyone, but the majority of people would like to do good in the world, have an impact. And because you're quantifying it and measuring it. It's not like some amorphous thing that we all want to do. It's we're all measuring specific objectives that you guys probably have, right? Um, and and then you you said something earlier that I just want to make sure we clarify for the listeners. You said because your crowdfunding, uh, people can invest in Lena Labs directly. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. So uh, so the way you, I was just saying the way you phrased it before, which is really cool, is you said. You kind of like enabling everyone to be like a, a benefit investor, like a public impact investor. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Well, yes. And, and and this actually kind of got back to us, right? Because when when we started our efforts in WeFunder, and I, I thank you for some of your pointers, by the way, really helped for us as well. Um, you know, we, we said, look, why do we, you know, you ask people, right, invest in us. And you have to answer that question, you know, with authenticity. Like, wh- why do you truly want to invest with us? And so... You always start with, we're a great company, we're going to make, you know, we're, our goal is to be profitable and therefore make make you a shareholder value. But then you ask the deeper question, like, really, why am I investing in you, <laughs> right? And then we start thinking, because you're, we're helping 10 million people to date, and we're going to help another, you know, few hundred million people down the road. And because there are a certain uh, markets that is not served, that if it's served, their lives will be better, and so, you know, as we just articulate that, you know, our investors started saying, oh, you're doing impact investment. And by investing in us, you're co-investing with us to provide impact. And so uh, that actually just kind of came about. And this is the beauty of, of crowdfunding, right? Your, your, your investors kind of became partners, uh, their, their fans, their customers, you know. Uh, so there is highly organic interaction with your investors. And they help us define who, who we are. And and I, I, I truly believe this, that, that in our mission to provide impact, everyone that invests in us has a role to play and is a part of that. So uh, the impact investment part has helped Alina quite a bit as well in our, in our crowdfund efforts. Yeah, that's awesome because I think I'll speak for me. Obviously, I can't speak for everybody. But one of the things that I feel when it comes to donating money to charity or, or investing in some sort of impact investment is I feel like as an individual who uh, most of my capital is invested in my own companies right now, right? So, and real estate and stuff, I, I feel like I, there's very little I can do. Like what difference could I make by putting my little check forward to something? But I feel like you guys kind of are solving that feeling in a way in that like you guys are, are as you said, still kind of focused on financial success, but also the things you're investing in are impact and because you're doing it at that scale we funder and 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 other partners that you have it's like my check isn't just kind of floating out there to some charity or something and then kind of i never hear from it ever again and i don't know the impact it seems like you're kind of enabling you know you're you're enabling you're like a force multiplier for good uh for investing from the impact investing side which is cool because i i I haven't looked into it much but it, it feels like that would feel like a new opportunity to me, you know, I feel that makes me feel different about my money actually hopefully helping because, <laughs> you know, what I have, I have put checks to things in the past and it just, I kind of wonder if I'm doing any real good in the world. And so it seems like you're, you're actually offering a path 
where it's, you know, trackable and clear and, and not, you know, because you're measuring things and because you're kind of running it as a public benefit organization, you know, it's like, it's not just going out there to pay for the, the management salary. And we're not really sure what good is being done on the end of the day. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. I hadn't thought. No, about no, that. We, and we enjoy doing it. Right. And it puts meaning to what we do. And then it allows me to then focus the team. Right. Because as every investor, we have now invest in that small business where we, that we can grant loans to. It's 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 investing into the 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 new uh, the the child that now has insurance uh, to ensure education is not you know disrupted you know when things happen uh, that's unplanned. So um, it aligns very well to that. Uh, and then you know then the geeks can just go unleash their innovation. Right, we just write code, right? Great UX. We focus on 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 doing that. But the other thing too that is actually highly synergistic to investing is that we attract partnerships, right? We attract the Asian Development Bank, we attract UNICEF, we attract, you know, the USAID. And so by doing that, it also reinforces the investment uh, because it's they're another force multiplier. They have matching funds, right, that help us, you know, equity free, <laughs> right, uh, to solve these problems. Nice. Um, uh, you know, the regulators are much, much more open to us to work with, right? We're not the payday lender or <laughs> we're not the, the right? The, so we're here to actually even even try to tackle uh, payday borrowing, right? Then it shouldn't be 140% interest rate and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it, it just really makes doing business um, easy uh, from that standpoint. And, and the geek in me kind of is excited because I get to do biometric and EKYC and, a, and AI and analytics and graph, graph tables and all that stuff right underneath. But knowing that there's tangible impact you're making, you're improving a credit score, you're you know allowing people to borrow at lower interest rates. So I guess the force feedback too of, of the innovation you apply, you can feel it right away because you can count the people you're helping. Uh, so it's been good. Uh, and, that, and that's why we're all, we're all energized, you know, to me, it's my like second cycle entrepreneur. You know, I started my first set of companies when I was your age. You know, early twenties and thirties, uh, and then I've exited a few of them. And if, and and then the World Economic Forum guilted me into like now you got to go return some of that to the world. Um, <laughs> uh, but now uh, that we're building all these startups that that are inclusive fintech focused, and again from from my life standpoint. You know, heading back to, to empty nesting, it feels like I can bet everything all over again uh, and, and do it in this space. So, so kind of it kind of makes you feel younger and more energetic, and you know, go out and do two more things. That's awesome. I love that. And and so if you if you're okay with this, that's what you're working on now, and that is awesome. And I'm glad we spent time talking about that. But I would like to touch on your background a little bit, simply because. You worked at Intel, you did a bunch of entrepreneurships and investment that I think people would benefit from hearing from. If, maybe even if we can distill a few concepts or principles that you, you know, you use to take an idea that, you know, might just stay as an idea and turn it into some real effort. Um, I think, you know, the audience would love to hear stuff like that. And then also, if we have time at the end, I'd love to hear to touch a little bit about the books you've written because I think those are exciting as well. Um, so if you're open to it, I'd love to hear it from what I was, from my, if my research is right, again, caveat, <laughs> um, but if my research is right, it seemed like you had some kind of like rapid fire exits in the, in the early 2000s. You had like three or four or whatever exits all within a few years of each other. Is that right? And, and if so, how, how? how? <laughs> well, that's, that's correct. But you know, I mean, uh, getting to that point is a lot of work. So I'm actually an immigrant, right? I grew up in the Philippines. I moved here when, in, when I was, you know, late teens, actually uh, 19 when I moved here. Um, I was one of those kind of conquered the world, you know, a bit naive at the time. And I said, look, I'm only going to work at Intel, Microsoft, and IBM because they're the best companies, right? And, and, and I was competing with Stanford grads and MIT grads, and I wanted to work in tech in, in these companies. So, um, you know, I, I, I did the usual hustle and, and, and you know, applied, must have been 30 times uh, until I realized, hey, I'm going to write code uh, and then uh, patent it and then present it to Intel and say, hey, if you want this code, you got to hire me uh, along with it. So kind of that's, I hacked my way into, I guess, this, this big companies at the time. But <laughs> yeah, I acquired myself before that term was invented, right? So that, that I guess that's the first step that kind of gave me a sense like I'm, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur uh, while I'm a geek. So I worked at Intel uh, for a while. I worked at Intel Architecture Labs. The internet was new at the time. We were trying to introduce voice over the internet. 
uh, synchronizing the multiple packets across the internet into a coherent voice was a technology that's needed. I worked on that. I uh, enjoyed doing it. Um, I then started really as a guy that thinks of what else can you do with the processor uh, at Intel. So we, I mean, you know, we did a lot of gaming, 3D rendering, you know, all that kind of stuff was really interesting. Then voice over the internet was interesting. Then crypt- cryptology for, for e-commerce really, really interesting then. And I really got good at that uh, as an engineer and was asked by Andy Grove to say, hey, you know, Intel's not interested in becoming a software company, but we want to be a part of that future. <laughs> so let's go build a, what's called a venture capital group. And I was new, right, at the time. Like, what's a VC? And that's just a few at the time. It's just Kleiner, Mayfield, Sequoia, all the, all the OGs in, in, in investing at the time. So I, I did get to move into venture investing. Um, appreciated how, you know, how taking risk was really important. And at that time, it's like geeks helping geeks, right? Now we have Deep Pocket at Intel, you're doing something nobody's done before and who else is going to fund you, right? So that's kind of the idea of venture capitalists at the time. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed deal making and the process. So I, I like the M&A process. I like, ter- I mean, believe it or not, I enjoy fundraising, <laughs> talking to VCs and negotiating term sheets and all that kind of stuff. One of the first ones I've ever done, <laughs> actually. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, but most of the things I really enjoy was the exit process. So we, I did include uh, on all my startups in their roadshows when we were printing the, the red herring, when we we're trying to like file the S4 and all that stuff and taking them public. So I did take about eight companies public when I was a VC. Um, wow. Then I also said, hey, it's, it seems like it's more fun to build. <laughs> so I did. Um, uh, the first one ended up like in a disaster, actually. I mean, the, the, the problem is when you, you, you leave as a successful VC at Intel, um, you know, I essentially literally had a business plan and a napkin close $10 million investment, right? Uncapped free money. Saves weren't a lot around then. So, um, but that really trained me wrong. You know, we uh, the, the company is called Glue Code. We built it. Um, you know, uh, you know, it very quickly felt not right. You know, halfway through it, and we burned through half of our capital. I returned it to the VCs and said, "I'm sorry, I kind of, I kind of did this wrong." Uh, but that failed, uh, and then I started realizing that I, I got to restart this bootstrap. So I did, um, and then got it to, to profitability. We discovered disruption is the key to the game. Uh, we entered the dawn of open source software. We were challenging IBM and Microsoft with free software. And really the big the big leverage point for me is that our software got good enough where it was disrupting big IBM deals, right? They were trying to close a deal with eBay and you know all these new emerging e-commerce companies. And these guys were preferring to use open source and they were preferring to use our stuff. And so I think Blue Code, actually Blue Code was the first ever Open source acquisition of IBM, and so oh, that wow. kind of just uh, that kind of just snowballed after that. So I did, I did get addicted. You know, there's a formula of building. And I figured, oh, there's a formula for building open source software, right? You pick the biggest, most expensive software with the most dishappiness, <laughs> unhappiness in it, and go start an open source project in it, <laughs> right? And then make make because you get a lot of developers <laughs> who <laughs> have a bone to pick with the current way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And- Chip on the shoulder is an amazing motivator, right? So we kind of just did that. Right? Let's go kill IBM or Microsoft or whatever. And so we, we started with the, the e-commerce application server, conquered that, IBM bought it. Uh, then we looked at integration. Uh, so ActiveMQ was kind of an integration software, a very expensive MQ series product from IBM, high dissatisfaction rate. So we kind of did the open source version of it, sold it uh, to Red Hat, uh, and then did a couple more down the road. But then there was a repeatable pattern, like build the source from open source, create a business model around support subscription, uh, have better documentation than the annoying player, then rinse, repeat, right? So I guess without calling it, it was an early version of a venture studio uh, for open source. Better and documentation. I I would have never guessed that that was a key piece, but that yeah. makes total sense. Everyone always complains about the documentation. So. Well, <laughs> That's why commercial companies in open source make money. It's a documentation, right? The code's free already. You can't sell free. Um, but that was kind of the, the impetus for this. And I really then thought that the world's changing. Software's driving the change. Um, and, and software that's driving the change is all changing philosophies and approach to doing business and approach to delivering goods. Sharing economy started to become a, a big part of that, right? And you look at the 
what's what technology is done accelerated by open source into changing the way we do business in like sharing economy and empowered by the cloud then you know you begin to look at the world evolving uh in in 2010 the world economic forum asked me to join it uh, as a young global leader so we were starting to think about the state of the world uh, in 2014 we started thinking about the fourth industrial revolution and how this might impact uh you know economies uh the Filipino in me kicked in and said, oh my God, this is a first world solution, right? The Philippines is no AI, no biometric, no all that kind of stuff, right? And is the fourth industrial revolution really a solution for the rich? And uh, fortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, but somebody had to like make sure that's not the case. So that's kind of when I said, okay, I'm going to go Southeast Asia. Uh, it's an evolving market. It's kind of our wild, wild west. Uh, let's take all these principles in the fourth industrial revolution you know, things like AI, biometric, 3D printing, all that kind of stuff, right? That's going to change the way we do business um, and and put that into practice. And and so as I, as we were putting that into practice, I used the two tools I know, venture capital and entrepreneurship. So I built startups, uh, funded companies. Uh, I've also worked with the big, the big telcos, the big banks, because they're the typical ones people touch. And documented the learnings in a book uh, called Ready or Not. <laughs> uh, it was called Ready or Not because it's really, you know, the question was, is emerging, are, are emerging countries ready or not uh, for the fourth industrial revolution? So the two two editions of it, uh, two and a half editions, actually. So in one edition that talked about what are the things you can do and how it would change things. And the second edition talked more about how it has changed uh, and what it's doing for um, the people that, you know, has not used e-commerce in the past, how inclusion was, um, I think we call it equitable economic development happened there. Uh, and then the and a half was like, how did the pandemic disrupted these things all over again? Uh, and I guess the other back half of, of half of that is, I'm, I'm going to start writing about it, is, is you know, the, the, the post-pandemic rebuild. I just don't feel like it's ready to be written because we haven't really gotten over this pandemic yet. But you know, no, it's just, just unfortunately. It's just, yeah. So a lot of the things I've done is probably because I'm old, right? I've been working on it for a long time, uh, <laughs> but I've learned a lot along the way. I think the 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 being able to work with a community in open source, kind of early on in my career, like led me to naturally want to collaborate. And that's to me, if there's one secret to our success formula, is that we've always, always, always collaborated, right? And I'm willing to learn again, right? So when I came back to the U.S., to be honest, I'm like. I'm going to go start from scratch, right? And actually apply that Y Combinator. Like, okay, I'm going to assume I've oh, not nice. seen a VC or a startup or had an exit. Like, I'm just a, the on the street entrepreneur. I went through the entire process actually to the interview and just didn't take the the, the, the deal. And then, you know, as you know, I, I, I reached out to you and said, dude, what's this crowdfunding thing, right? And, and all of that. So that, that learning is, is always there for me, I guess. And then the natural need to collaborate is, is there. And that's kind of the character of my company as well. I love it. That seems to be the thing that ties it all together. It seems like if you zoom out community and, and having the community-driven open source at the big, early part of your career and now the kind of community-focused stuff, that seems to tie it all together. Uh, one pet question, I guess, as we close, kind of s slow things down here. When you look back at the first book and you look back, of course, at the more recent books, how do you feel about your predictions? I feel like if, if I if I, you know, I was skimming the notes trying to get prepared um, yesterday and it seemed like you were predicting a lot of like kind of on the nose stuff. This is what, like five years ago that you wrote the first book, probably, right? It's like... Big, big data slash AI, you know, like um, robots, which we've just been seeing a lot of developments in, in terms of like Tesla humanoid robotics and, you know, of course, Boston Dynamics and other things like that. And it seems like some of those pr predictions are holding up pretty good. How do you feel about them? No, I feel really good about it. But the, the, but the angst I have over this prediction was the one that I'm pleasantly surprised with, right? The, the, the predictions are obvious, right? These things are likely to be successful. But the fact that they did work in emerging countries, that they did work with not just that was, that was my my fear thesis. Like it's gonna only serve the rich. Yeah, and I think that that the fact that these trends touched more segments of our population than I thought it was gonna be was what makes you know me happy about the book. <laughs> um, 
That's and, awesome. So, and, so ready. So ready is the conclusion. We. It turns out that emerging markets made more ready than ready. we thought. I guess more <laughs> so ready than we thought. Kind of the, the point, and 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 <laughs> I, I think humanity is still. You know, we we'll always still show like a, a lighter note. Like we, you know, it wasn't used to oppress. It wasn't used to increase the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, in fact, it is doing the opposite of that. It's democratizing. You know, at the time, innovation, which was software, now it's democratizing financial access, which is doing fintech. Uh, and so it just feels right to like, I'm going to democratize investment in my company too. So uh, <laughs> kind of that worked out uh, all good. Um, and and that's that. the journey we're in now. So we're early into it, uh, but we're very hopeful, very optimistic and, and excited. I love it. So w- one final question and then I'll let you go. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, the audience is going to love hearing about all these stories. But um, one one thing that I've been wondering about, and maybe this will be in your next book, so don't you don't have to steal, you don't have to spill all the beans if you don't want, but it seems like with SpaceX and Starlink and and, and any competitors they're in, we're, we're now going to be able to have relatively high-speed internet access effectively anywhere on the globe soon, like relatively soon, you know, the next couple of years. Um, it seems like, you know, of the three and a half billion people who are not online yet, some portion of them is going to be coming online. And then, of course, all of them are probably unbanked or at least not on a modern system. And they're all going to basically overnight have access to all of these technologies you've been predicting. So it seems like there are regions of the world and populations that are going to be potentially making like a huge leap and and I I have a concern, you know, not knowing too much about the topic. It seems to me that like those those areas are probably even less ready than the areas you were talking about before, right? It seems like there's some areas of the world where this is going to be like leaping hundreds of years in the future in like five years. So I don't know. I don't know if you've thought about like the impact specifically of kind of like well, satellite based internet and you know kind of rapidly onboarding the rest of the world to to the internet that, that seems like there's a it's gonna be some serious disruption coming uh well, there, there will that. be and and, and and i think it's positive disruption and, and again dating myself here we invested in companies as early as iridium right this is the first uh uh <laughs> geosynchronous yeah. satellite that promised internet to the world but and then um, when i we ran the telco three to five years ago google was launching the balloons for the internet i don't know if you remember those um they actually did they actually lo- launched it and kind of experimented on it. And then uh, finally, you know, VSATs, uh, I think we're now at the right time at the right technology maturity with the right players like Tesla uh, playing in it. That the, the promise of internet for all is coming about and internet for all in any device as well, right? Including IOTs. So um, I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the next five years. Uh, I think it's going to increase democratization of um, economic development, but I'm actually more interested and going to explore how it impacts social structures, right? Do we have separate governments still, right? And can people still, can, can we now have universal ID, right? Do I need to have passports and, you know, do, you know, um, you know, the citizenship, right? Is that, is it, do you belong to just one country or we're just, in, you know, so th- those are, I think, kind of, you know, more fun, longer, longer term things to think about. Uh, but the pathways to there, to getting there is, is here, right? The banking is no longer as inaccessible as we think. Um, you know, we never thought mobile phones can be a primary internet um, uh, platform for majority of the people around the world. And they're feasibly doing it, doing e-commerce with it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think those are all coming. I think, I think internet for all is truly like just a few years away. <laughs> Um, and 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 what's more fascinating to observe and anticipate is how that changes social structures, uh, how that changes you know economics around the world, and you know couple that with Bitcoin and you know central bank digital currencies and you know the the going away of fiat cash, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're approaching Star Trek territory, so it's, it's fun for me, and I hope to still be a part of that when that happens. <laughs> uh, that, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah, the funny part is, I always had that thought, you know, even a decade ago, when it was further away, that you know, eventually the nation state would become less important. <laughs> you know, where you were born should should matter less, should matter less, and you can kind of see a line of sight of how it might actually matter less. But the thing I never understood is like, well, how would you get there? But I think you just made the right connection that I've been starting to think about, which is like, 
crypto started on the side, right? Crypto just said, okay, here's Bitcoin and now here's Ethereum and here's all these other smart contract platforms. And now we can start doing decentralized finance as an example on the side. And it just so turns out that we're kind of like blurring the lines and going outside the lines of, of nation states. And now I can pay you in any country. And if I do it through crypto, you know, it's, it's, it, it kind of makes it easier. And the fact that the SWIFT system exists doesn't really matter <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> necessarily. And it's like your, your whole point about you know passports and stuff, I think is actually the same, right? Before I would have said, I don't know how you'd get to a world without passports uh, or where you're not relying primarily on passports. But here you can create something to decide based on crypto or, or once everyone's online, right? All of a sudden you can create something, universal ID or whatever, and as long as people accept it, right, it doesn't have to replace passports at first. It could just be another option. But then it becomes a much better, more useful option to everybody. And and I think we'll naturally just gravitate to the better option over time. And then, of course, you know, who knows if nation states will be okay with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's well, another you know, conversation. And the whole point, right, the biometric, right, why even carry any identification, right? My face is my ID. <laughs> um, we've built. Uh, technologies in emerging countries like pay by face is the joke, right? It's like you don't have to pull out a credit card. You just put a camera in front of me and, you know, <laughs> yep. I'll wake up That's the tips. That's Brennan. Um, Brennan wants to buy a sandwich. Here's yeah, Brennan's so, bank account. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's going to be a, a fun, fun world from, from an innovator standpoint. Um, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll preserve some bandwidth so this world continues to exist. So uh, I'm sure we'll start thinking about the, the, the you know, global warming and all that kind of stuff as well. But, you know, all of these, you know, technology has a hand. And if you're a geek, you're part of it. So it's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's good. <laughs> cool. Well, Winston, amazing to have you. Amazing to connect again. The audience is going to love it. Uh, thank you for coming on. And then uh, open invitation. Uh, when you have something else coming out, when Tolino launches a new cool company, something you want to share, you can come back on. We'll have you back on. You can talk about that as well. Absolutely. I look forward to that. Thank you, Brandon. This is, this is a lot of fun. Great conversation. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks, man. So if you enjoyed that podcast, if you like creativity and topics like that, or if you work in a creative field, you'll definitely love the IAA, the International Advertising Association. You should check them out at iaaglobal.org. The IAA is one of the oldest running since 1938 associations for creative professionals and is currently acting as the global compass sharing information with this gathering cool minds like you've just seen to chat um and to understand exactly what's happening today um so i encourage you to go check them out iaaglobal.org <laughs>